We shall be reading from the book of Job. The book of Job. The book of Job, chapter 5. Job 5, Job 5, verse 1. From the book of Job, chapter 5. Call out now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays a simple one. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far from safety, they are crushed in the gate, and there is no deliverer. Because the hungry eat up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns, and the snare snatches their substance. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Yet a man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. But as for me, I would seek God, and to God I would commit my cause. Who does great things and unsearchable, marvellous things without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly. And those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty, so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noontime as in the night. But he saves the needy from the sword, from the mouth of the mighty, and from their hand. So the poor have hope, and injustice shuts her mouth. Behold, happy is a man who God corrects. Therefore do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. For he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles, yet in seven no evil shall touch you. In famine he shall redeem you from death, and in war from the power of the sword. You shall be hidden from the scores of the tongue, and you shall not be afraid of destruction when it comes. You shall laugh at destruction and famine, and you shall not be afraid of the beasts of the earth. For you shall have a covenant with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. You shall know that your tent is in peace. You shall visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. You shall also know that your descendants shall be many, and your offspring like the grass of the earth. You shall come to the grave at a full age, as a sheaf of grain ripens in its season. Behold, this we have searched out. It is true. Hear it and know it for yourself. This is the proposition of the word of God. Behold, this we have searched out. It is true. Hear it and know it for yourself. That's the word of God's proposition. Know it and take advantage of it. Because in the word of God there are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And man who bows down with all cautiousness into the word of truth, of freedom of God, he finds things very serious in which if he takes advantage of it will be a blessing for him. So, God starts to speak. Call out now any saint you want, any person you want, and reflect now about the life of man. Natural man, in general, is foolish. That's who man is. And what does this mean? The foolish man said in his heart, there is no God, so it doesn't take God under account. And who is a foolish man? He never listens to the word of God. He never takes it under account. He doesn't care about the word of God. It's that group of people who say, we don't want to hear about the word of God. Foolish in their hearts. And the simple man, the person who hears the word of God but doesn't do it. In general terms, this is man.
but there are exceptions. But if man lives in this situation, in this philosophy, thought, ways, habit, opinion, that there is no God, and anyway, I don't care even if there is a God, and I don't want to hear the word of God, and even if I do hear the word of God, I don't want to do it. But then there's consequences that are serious. The word of God says, the wrath of a foolish man kills him. He's full of pride, doesn't know how to humble himself. Division comes from pride. And through his wrath, he's killed. And the simple one, he's slain by envy. But I believe in the word of God, I accept God. Why are things going bad in my life? Because he doesn't do the word of God, and he complains, and his envy slays him. It's a way that is sure of the natural man of this world, who God calls foolish and simple, and even more so. He's got consequences in his family. This person has horrible consequences in his family. His sons are far from salvation, they won't be saved. They can't find the way of truth, the way of salvation. And they are oppressed and are unfortunate in their lives. They are afflicted. They're saddened and sorrowed. And no one can help them and free them. They are without defense. They're alone. But they might have lots of money. They might have lots of possessions. Maybe they've got strength, educated. A foolish man, as a family man, will be destroyed. And his harvest, even if he's very rich, someone else will eat it and enjoy it. And his property, someone else will have it in the end. He gathers and gathers and gathers, but someone else will have it in the end. Just think, the foolish man doesn't think about his future as far as God is concerned, and the simple man does the same. And the rich man heard, foolish, foolish man, today they're going to take your soul from you, all your possessions, who they belong to now, because he was problemed in his life because of the great blessing he had, and man can be problemed from good events and bad events. What am I going to do now? Everything's going well. I know, the foolish man said, the foolish rich man, I will bring down my barns and make new ones and fill them up. Then I will say to my soul, my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. He never took God under account. He's a foolish man. And what does the fool say? I've got lots of money when I build a house. And what does he build it on? Sand. Because he doesn't think about tomorrow. He doesn't take under account tomorrow. If he do take under account tomorrow, he will give much importance to the word of God because tomorrow belongs in the hands of God, not in our hands. Tomorrow doesn't depend on us. Tomorrow is in the hands of God. It doesn't take under account about tomorrow, if it rains, if it snows, if it, there's floods. He just, he just builds a beautiful house on the sand. Rivers come, rain comes, a great downfall. That's man. And the word of God assures us that sorrow and pain in the life of man they don't come by chance from nowhere, they don't sprout from the earth. But this man is born, has been born for sorrow. That's natural man, born for sorrow. And so the word of God can explain to us well how the chicks of an eagle cannot fly. They're in their nests and they're waiting but they're born to fly. A time will come and they will fly high. That's how a foolish man is. He might be happy in a period of time of his life, but he's born for sorrow and sadness. The time will come when everything will be brought down. Nothing will be left standing. Nothing. And no matter how high they are, no matter what they've succeeded in their lives, no matter what problems they have solved, a time will come of, for their downfall, and it will be great. But through these people, now the doctrine of the Word of God comes and separates a small remnant. A remnant which doesn't think in that way. They acknowledge 
that this is natural man, but they have understood from the word of God that if they do something, they will take advantage of it. They will be helped. But they say, for me, I will call upon God and I will commit my course to God, my life, everything. I will ask help from God and I will trust everything to God. That's being smart. A great trick. A true fact. For a person to come to his senses, to understand that he can't do anything on his own, he does need help from Christ to call upon the name of Jesus because he says, whoever calls upon my name will be saved to commit my course to the Lord because he says, commit your ways to the Lord, hope in him and he will act in your life and he will bring your righteousness into light. It's worth it then, at least, to try it. It's worth trying it, to see the consequences, to see the results. Do it with faith, the word of God says, so I'll try it. This situation that makes me suffer and is difficult and I can't succeed in it, I will go, as the word of God says, I will go in my room, lock the door behind me, I will kneel and humble myself and say, Lord, I've messed up until now, but please, this situation of mine, this problem of mine, this thing that makes me suffer and makes me sad and I'm anxious about, please, Lord, I'm leaving it to you. I thank you because I know by faith, I know that you always listen to me and especially when I do your word. And I plead with you, please. Please do according to your word. Much, much more and better than what I'm thinking of or I can ask from you. I'm not asking from you. I'm just giving you my problem to you. I'm committing my cause to you. I don't know what you're going to do about it. I don't want to teach you what to do about it, Lord. I don't want to lead you to what to do, Lord, because whatever I say will be a mistake. A mistake. Simply, according to your word, my cause, I'm committing it to you, Lord. And if a person does this with fasting and prayer, it will be good for him. You'll commit your cause. You will thank God. You will pray. You will plead. You'll even beg if it's necessary. And you'll get up with joy and leave with the assurance that God has taken care of your cause. And you will not be at ease. You'll continue praying about it. And you will not give up. Nor will you lose your faith. The result, it is he who does great things. And be careful of this word, unsearchable. You cannot understand the great things that God will do. No man has this wisdom, this understanding, this logic and knowledge to understand how and when and in what way will God give a solution and an act. Surely he will do great things and unsearchable things and marvelous things without number. Not one or two. You won't be able to number them. Because it is He who gives rain on the earth. He sends water on the field. He sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty. Have you got a crafty man in your life who will make him frustrated? It is He who catches the wise in their own craftiness and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. It is he who saves the needy and gives hope to every weak person, poor person, and unimportant person. And truly, God does all these things. But, the will of God goes on. There is the majority, therefore, let's say 100% of people, who among the 100% of people, 30% of them, 20% of them, 
one small remnant of them truly take advantage of the word of God. And from that 30% of people, there is a smaller percentage. This percentage is which God calls blessed. Happy is a man whom God corrects. Therefore do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. It is he who accepts his life that it depends on God completely. He accepts God's actions in his life and especially the difficulties that God permits in his life and he enters under the complete admonishment of God. God controls his life completely. A small example, David, a man who had a heart like God's, who would do and did all the will of God. He never started something before asking God, should I Lord or shouldn't I? What should I do, God? He had placed his life completely under the control of the Lord. An example in the New Testament, Paul. I will go and preach in Jerusalem. No, Gerritasus, Paul, he went there. God's starting to train him so he can enter under the control of the Holy Spirit, to enter under the control of God. For his life to be controlled completely in small things and big things from the Holy Spirit and Christ. And this can happen only if you do not despise, complain about, you don't lose your peace when God permits, like David, persecution from Saul, and sometimes to be cornered so much so that he could not flee, but only with God's intervention. Or like Paul, who when he reached Philippi, and the first believers were created, they arrested him. He did not despise God's chastening. He didn't say, God, where am I in jail now? What will I do now? I'm in prison. But are you God? Did I ask you? Didn't you bring me here? He never said that, but what did he do? He always praised God with joy because he knew that his life was under the control of God. Now, this is only about 10% of the people, but he's made a steadfast decision. I will never complain or whatever happens in my life. I will never go against myself, nor others, or God. Never. I will never go against anybody. I will never say it's his fault. If it wasn't for him... But I will say that God is behind all these things. And if it wasn't Him, it would have been someone else. And if this didn't happen, something else would have happened. But God is taking me through paths of righteousness because He's the Lord and He's my shepherd. I'm under the complete control of Christ in which I accept and call my shepherd. That's it. He's my shepherd. Nor left, nor right. I never take the first initiative. I never put my logic, my wisdom and my thought in front. The results. You pass through six sorrows, but God will always free you from them. Yes, even a seventh will come, even greater, it will not touch you. You will enter famine, but he shall redeem you from death. Famine, you will not die. You will go through war even. But the power of the sword will not touch you. Thou shalt accuse you, judge you, and criticize you. The scourge of the tongue, God will protect you. No one will harm you. I will not defame you. Because God will come when they judge you and criticize you and God will justify you. Hallelujah. People curse you, God will bless you. People criticize you, God will justify you. People accuse you, God will exalt you.
You will see destruction coming. What are we going to do now, Lord? Calamity is coming. What am I going to do? Doesn't God know this? This person knows that God knows. Not only that, but you will not fear of the destruction that is to come because you know that God is greater than any destruction. He's right before you. Your sanctuary, your war, your defender, your redeemer, the beast of the field will gather around you. But you will not fear because you know that God will be with you. An example. Elisha. All of Syria was around him, outside his house. But he had peace. Serenity. He didn't understand a thing. All around him, surrounded, great army. He did not fear. His servant said to him, Lord, Master, they're coming against us. They're going to arrest us. My child, he said, those who are with us are much, much more than those who are against us. What are you talking about? Now they're much, much more. Who, Lord, we're alone. I see no one. You see no one. Father, open his eyes. Those who are with us, and God opened his eyes, and he saw between the army of the Syrians and himself, he saw an army of angels. That's why you're not scared, of course. I'm not scared either now. Why? Did you have to see so you won't be afraid? Isn't it better for you to believe and not be afraid? But for you to believe and for your faith to be justified, you must have delivered your life into the hands of the Lord, under His control. Not with words, but with actions, with your life, with our way. We must always say, the Lord is with me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Why? Because I'm under God's control. Christ, should I go there? Go. Since you went where Christ sent you, won't he protect you? If you do what Christ says, won't he protect you? But you must do this. And when you turn back home, after that war, after that fight, after that way, the difficult way you walked on, of chastening, of trial, of suffering, you will know that in your tent there will be peace. There, in your neighborhood, in your house, you will have peace. And my brethren, our tent is this body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In here, there will be peace. You will visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. You shall know also that your descendants shall be many. You will see fruit. And here I want to point this out, my brethren. This is a secret of great fruitfulness. For us to let ourselves under the complete control of the Lord. And for us to pursue this, for ourselves to be under God's control. Complete, complete freedom, peace and lots of fruit now. And your descendants, your offsprings, even more blessed. Not only your present will be blessed in the peace of Christ and in Christ's happiness, but also your offspring will be blessed and the continuation of your life will be even more blessed. And in the end, you shall come to the grave at a full age as a sheaf of grain ripers in its season. Know these things. Understand these things the word of God says and take advantage of them. We haven't got many years before us. The end of all things is at hand. Now is a welcome time. Now is a day of salvation. Now take advantage of it. What are the conditions of this way? The way of the Holy Spirit. Obedience to the word of God. Obedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Seeking Christ, seeking the Holy Spirit and devotion truly to the will of God. Who is the enemy of this life? Walking in two ways, a little bit here and a little bit over there. A little bit here 
and more over there. A little bit here, and even more over there. You will not have this result with this way of walking. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot be in the world and in God's people. If you want to be a part of that small remnant which the word of God calls blessed and happy because their lives is controlled, is under the control of God. And they, they never ever complain or go against God for whatever God permits in their lives. Amen, brethren. It's in our hands. We will decide this. We will decide of the way in which we must choose to walk on. It's our choice. There's a way of curse, foolish, for foolish man. There's a way of blessings, the person who calls upon the will of God and commits his cause, his way to God. And there's a way of great blessings, the person who devotes himself and delivers himself under the complete control of Christ. And now we know these things. Now the word of God revealed these things to us. Now no one can say I didn't know. I don't know. But now it's our turn. Are we going to take advantage of the truth of the gospel? Or we turn right and left according to the desire of our hearts or according to our logic or according to the advice of other people? But God bless us. Let's make right decisions.